Amen. Beloved, as you run out from this place to spread the joy of Christmas to all, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love. May it be so. Amen.
grace and peace to you on this first Sunday in Christmas. What a joy it is to have you in worship today. Please join me in our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise the Lord, all God's angels. Praise God, all the Lord's hosts. Let us praise the name of the Lord, for God commanded and we were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, who see monsters and altars, fire and air, snow and frost, stormy wind filling God's feet. Let us praise the name of the Lord, for God's name alone is exalted. God's glory is above earth and heaven. We are God's faithful people. Praise the Lord. Savior, we are in awe of you today. As we continue to think and ponder the beautiful perplexity of Christmas, we discover again and again your mercies for us. We remember that you loved us enough to become one of us and to know intimately our joys and sorrows. You showed us that redemption can come from unlikely places. You reminded us that kings can come from barnyards. Truly, what you did for us is amazing, Lord, and the plan you have for our world is wonderful. We ask that you would continue to give us new eyes to see how you are working in the world, so we can give you praise each day. Amen. Friends, although as Christmas, at Christmas we are reminded of the many ways that God has cared for us, so often we live lives of anxiety and we try to fend for our own needs. In our desire to protect ourselves, we often hurt others. So let us now lift up our sins to God so that we may be forgiven and set back on the path of love. Please join me in our prayer of confession. 
Thank you, Almighty God, for your faithfulness over this last year, that you have been with us in good times and bad, through ordinary days and special occasions, and for giving us good memories we can return to from time to time. Forgive us, we have lost the spirit of Christmas. Forgive us of stress or financial pressure or overindulgence. Siblings in Christ, our sins may be great, but God's love for us is greater. Know that even though we will always be works in progress, God's love for us will never dwindle or wane. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are. Given family of God, please join me in saying what we believe by using the words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, rejoice this morning for our Prince of Peace has come. The one who will heal our wounds is here. Our Savior is here. Join me in spreading peace to one another and to our world where Jesus is born. Peace be with you. Please share a sign of peace.
Our first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 63, verses 7 through 9. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. The word of the Lord. Friends, as we uh, prepare to spend time in prayer, both this week and today, I ask you to remember the following prayer requests. Um, you can be praying for John Elliott, the grandson of Judith Elliott, who's returned to the hospital this past week. Uh, please also remember in your bulletin all those listed as ongoing prayer requests and recent prayer requests and lift them up in prayers throughout the week. <coughs> Lastly, I invite you to be praying for our mission partners. Uh, Marilyn Borst, who helps run a women's ministry in uh, Kirkuk Women's Jail to share God's love with them and their children. And our other mission partners are Hai Young Lee, Hai Yai Young Lee and Kurt Esslinger, uh, who are mission co-workers in South Korea. Friends, God's love for us indeed is steadfast, so let us turn to God in prayer this morning. Faithful God, we thank you for Isaiah's words, which we just read, and their reminder to us of your commitment to us. Indeed, as we look back on Israel's history, we see again and again your steadfast love played out, played out for them. Even though they made many mistakes, and even though they again and again turned away from you and the life that you called them to live, you never gave up on them. You return to them over and over again in their time of need and never abandon them. As Isaiah said of you, in his steadfast love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. We are thankful, Lord, because we know that this committed love is not just for Israel, but truly for all people. And know that when we take the time to look back on our lives, we can see a history of your faithful love and provision for us in both the abundant and lean times of our lives. So knowing of your love and care for all people, we present to you our concerns for our lives and the world. We ask you to bring comfort, Lord, to the Fritz family who are mourning this week, Lord. We lift up to you as well, John Elliott, and ask that you bring healing and restoration as he recovers in the hospital. We also present to you our mission partners, Marilyn, Haya Young, and Kurt. We thank you for their faithful ministry in Iraq and South Korea, and ask that you would bring, uh, ask that you would bless their ministry efforts so that they might bear much fruit. We can confess deep concern for the hatred and racism in our world as we see violence against against Jewish people in New York. We ask you to bring healing to the physical and mental wounds of those attacked, 
and ask that you would help us to be a light of love and tolerance in our communities. God, we ask for your provision for all those who are sick, grieving, lonely, sad, afraid, poor, abused, overlooked, and imprisoned, and ask that you would provide for all of these people in the ways that they need it most. God, we also lift up to you our prayers and desires for the new year. We give, we give you our gratitude for the blessings we have experienced this year and ask that this upcoming year will be marked by joy, love, and peace for our whole world. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Please be seated. Beloved, good morning and welcome here to Wayne Presbyterian Church. It is good to see you here in worship. We ask that you'll sign the Ritual of Friendship pads that you'll find in the center aisle of your pew and pass them along to the people sitting next to you. And as the pew, the pad comes back to the center aisle, please take a look at the people who have signed it and so you can greet each other by name afterwards. I'd like to raise up for your attention a few announcements in the bulletin. On Tuesday, January 21st, Wayne Presbyterian Church will be hosting the Philadelphia Presbyterian Meeting. And we are going to be celebrating because our own VJ Agarwal is going to be dis uh, installed as the moderator of the Philadelphia Presbytery. Woohoo! <laughs> and so, we are asking that you volunteer and come and serve as greeters, lunch servers, ushers, stewards, and shuttle van drivers. And please see Becky Greenhouse if you would like to sign up for that. And just come and cheer him on. This is a wonderful honor for him and for our church. The Wayne Presbyterian Church Book Club will be beginning its first session on January 5th at 9.30 in Fireside. We are going to be exploring holy envy, finding God in the faith of others. This is Barbara Brown Taylor's book, and we will be hearing from speakers from the Jewish faith, from the Islamic faith, from Hinduism and Buddhism. We'd like to also raise up for your attention the Women's Annual Winter Retreat. It'll be on January 31st and February 1st at the St. Raphaela Center and will be led by our very own Sarah Hostetter. Come and learn about creating Sabbath. Although it was not listed in our bulletin this morning, we have with us Joyce Tanyan, who is going to bring a minute from mission Joyce is with Water is Life, Kenya. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, where I live and work in southern Kenya near Mount Kilimanjaro, the way we greet each other in the morning is you say, Enka Kenya Sidai. And that means morning beautiful. OK, and then what you say is, eh? Because it, it's a beautiful morning, so you have to agree. So, Enka Kenya Sidai. Eh? eh. Good. Um, so I think maybe some of you have seen me before, a few, all, many, a few, a few, okay. Well, um, you all as a church have been supporting us for, I'd say about six years now. Um, I wanna read you something from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, it's chapter nine, starting in verse 35. And it's entitled, this section in my, in my version, the NIV is, the workers are few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, that's us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So we, I started, I'm the founder of Water is Life Kenya. I founded it with my, my father and my co-founder in Kenya, Joseph Larasha. And we took this to heart. You know, we saw people harassed and helpless without clean water, without enough income to keep their kids in school. And we said, we're the workers. We'll take this on. We'll be willing, we're willing to do this. And so we've been doing this work in Kenya uh, since 2006. The, the organization officially started in 2007, and we've helped with your help and support and your prayers. We've been able to help more than 60,000 people. So that's just, it's just grassroots. It's basically, you know, it's us. It's just, it's us. It's us in the field, you all supporting us, and your prayers and your support is having fruit. It's bearing a lot of fruit. Um, every community that we've helped, and we've done 21 major water projects so far, reduces the burden of disease, the burden of carrying water long distance, and I want to give you the example of one person in particular. Her name is Dorcas. 
Uh, when we met her back in 2007, she used to walk eight hours every day for water. She was, had to cross the border into Tanzania to get water. She was harassed at the water point. The water wasn't always available. Sometimes she would be come, come back empty-handed. And she started, has been do, doing this when she started, um, when she had started having a family when she was 14 years old. Right, so that was her work. She's a woman. Her work is to fetch water. That's what they do. And so after the water project came to her area, the first borehole that we ever did in 2007, now her water walk reduced from eight hours to less than 45 minutes. So every single day, she has seven hours back. Think about that. What would you do with an extra seven hours in your day? Well, what did Dorcas do? She went back to school. While her daughter, own daughter was in high school, she went back to school and got her GED. She always had a dream of becoming a teacher, and she did that. She finished high school, she got her GED, then she came to me and she sat on my couch in my, in my room and said, Joyce, can you help me go to college? We helped her go to college to go to, now she is an early childhood development teacher. So just think about that, that's one person. Think of that blossom that was tightly shut that now has been able to open and grow and develop as a person and then multiply it times all those 60,000 and all that opportunity and the talents being realized and the, the business ladies, the, the teachers, the veterinary doctors that are in that midst that now can come forward. So that's what we've been doing together. Um, our major program is Water Project. We also have a second program, which is a animal husbandry program. We work them with the Maasai community. All their in income and livelihood come through cows and livestock. So we train them how to be better business people, how to diversify into different kinds of livestock, how to manage the drought cycle. And the third thing that we do is we work with women who do this beautiful bead work, and we have a handicraft, uh, handicrafts division where we provide income to um, dozens of families. So you'll see me out there afterwards. We have our handicrafts with us. Um, so welcome to come and shop and talk. And um, we just thank you so much for your continued support. Maybe when uh, I come back in May, if we get a chance, I can come back with my co-founder and give a more lengthy talk to some of you who might be more interested to know all the things that we're doing. So meanwhile, thank you so much. Um, God bless you all. Happy New Year. Thank you. Amen and amen. Beloved, God is good all the time, and God has blessed us richly. Let us return to God a portion of those blessings in our offering.
gracious God, you have given us so many gifts. You've brought us loved ones who care for us. You've given us places to live. You've provided food to strengthen us and clothes to keep us warm. You've given our lives meaning and purpose. You've given us this church family to uplift us and care for us. But even greater than all of these gifts is the gift of Christ. We will be forever grateful that you shared your son with us so that we would know your love and receive salvation through him. Out of gratitude for all that you have given us this year, we give back to you some of what you have given us. May you bless these gifts so that they may be used to bless others as well. Amen. Beloved, our second reading comes from the book of Matthew, reading in the second chapter. Listen for God's word to the church. <coughs> now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Our earthly journeys begin with announcements of our impending arrival and preparations being made for us to become members of our families. Depending on one's birth order, or if one is an only child, it is inevitable that family dynamics will change with the advent of a newborn in the household. One's experiences from this moment on will either be individual or shared with a family or group. Group or personal triumphs can be celebrated in a sport like football. While it is a team sport, we also acknowledge the efforts of players who hold the various positions in the game. People who play in the position of running back have their jobs defined by their placement on the field. The running back may be called on to block for the quarterback, to take a handoff or receive a pass and run with the ball. Fans of American football have enjoyed the illustrious careers of several athletes who have played in this particular position. Some of those famous people include Marcus Allen, Larry Zonka, Emmett Smith, Jim Brown, Barry Sanders, and Walter Sweetness Payton. Oh yeah. When the ball was handed to number 34 of the Chicago Bears, it was pure poetry. The manner in which Walter Payton leapt over defenders and evaded blocks and ran the ball in for a touchdown was thrilling. 
A player that takes on the challenge of being a halfback or fullback must be somebody who has sure hands and is able to catch or hold on to the ball. The player also needs to have the physical ability to harness their blocking skills in order to protect the quarterback again, or create a seam or path for the running back to zig left or jag right in a detour that will help them with the path forward. Added to this conglomeration of athletic gifts is the capacity for endurance. As the name running back suggests, one must add to their skills speed, agility, and the endurance to run. Please allow me to conduct an unscientific poll by a show of hands, how many people enjoy jogging or running? <laughs> Nobody? Oh, a few hands are going up, okay, great. Running, while it is a thing of beauty and a great way to maintain good health, can also be a useful strategy for self-preservation in the face of danger. Our human history has not always been one that is filled with self-determined adventures like the one that Lewis and Clark embarked on on the Pacific coast. In times past, people have had to take a detour from their life plans and have had instead to run for their lives because of invading troops or a faction of their own government that is persecuting them. Such was the case with the Ottoman Empire when they persecuted Armenians and systematically killed them. The same happened with Jews in Nazi Germany. Unfortunately, this story continues today. You may recall the awful violence that the world witnessed during the Rwandan conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis. Similar atrocities were being committed in Darfur, in Sudan. The Janjaweed, a government-backed militia of the Arab tribes in Sudan, were raping women and girls, starving people, and committing mass murder in Darfur. This ethnic cleansing that our global community condemned left us with the shocking statistic of 100 people dying each day. This also meant that 5,000 people lost their lives every month. The result of the genocide in Darfur is that there were two and a half million people who had been displaced within the country. Genocides and holocausts have created millions of refugees around the world. People have had to run away from their home country in order to escape those who are plotting to kill them. It is not often the case that people will get advance warning of impending danger when one has been targeted because of one's ethical beliefs, one's political affiliation, or one's ethnicity. Sometimes gunshots and screaming people being attacked by others as the only notice that you'll receive. There's a story of one family that was warned by the former students of the husband. He had taught many of the soldiers in high school, and the soldiers had been ordered by the party to eliminate people who disagreed with the dictatorial tendencies of the president. So these young pioneers went to warn the family that they would be next. Perhaps they would be subjected to the cruelest forms of torture or be thrown into the river with people in the nearby villages hearing their screams as they were torn limb from limb by crocodiles. Taking important documents such as university degrees and passports, the young couple bundled their two girls, an infant and a newborn, into the car. They drove away from their home, leaving the lights on and the other car in the garage. After they had driven two hours from home, the woman began to sob. She told her husband that she feared for her parents' lives and for those of her siblings and their families. Her teary confessions of her thoughts about the family soon grew into loud wailing that matched the incessant crying of the infant. Her husband lovingly asked what was troubling her now. He assured her that they were closer to the border, they would make it. But she cried out, we left black. Black was their beautiful dachshund, 
that was adored by the family and the neighbors. They wept for their beloved dog, who had been a great companion for their three-year-old. However, they prayed that the neighbors would notice that something was amiss because the lights were on during the day and perhaps they would go and check and find the dog and take care of him. Seeking refuge in a different nation, as this family did, may be the only viable choice that one has to survive. Becoming a refugee is not an ideal situation, but when you have family depending on you for protection, the choice to leave your home and most of your belongings becomes vital for their survival. In some cases, people who are being shot or starved to death or sexually abused may have to escape to a more peaceful place within their country. And leaving their homes and farms and livestock, they become what are known as displaced persons. The reasons why people become refugees or eternally displaced persons is not an easy subject to broach on this first Sunday in Christmas time when we should be celebrating the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ into the world. This should be a time of feasting and of presence with one another. While this may be so, it is also a time for us to reflect on the meaning of Emmanuel, God with us. The reading from this second chapter of Matthew this morning describes the early period of Jesus' life. King Herod, in a fit of jealous rage, that someone else would be king, declared that all baby boys who were two years old and younger should be killed. Joseph received a warning in a dream that he should take Mary and the baby and leave the country. They traveled southwest to Egypt to escape Herod's henchmen and became political refugees. <coughs> Joseph and Mary raised Jesus in Egypt until enough time had passed and they could safely return to Bethlehem. King Herod had died, but to Joseph's dismay, Herod's son Archelaus, who was a more vicious tyrant, ascended to the throne. He could not return to Bethlehem, which was his hometown, and in order to protect his young wife and baby, Joseph took them to Nazareth. This was a place where they became internally displaced because they were no longer living there in their ancestral home. Rather, they lived in the country in the part of the country that had been filled with Gentiles. The story of the birth of Jesus and his formative years in exile in Egypt is one that many people can identify with. Early in his life, Jesus and his family ran away from those who sought to kill him. Jesus became a refugee. Christ experienced living as an internally displaced person as well when they made their hometown in Nazareth. God's son, the one whom we believe was fully divine and fully human, lived out a full range of human emotions and situations. Jesus truly is Emmanuel, God with us. The Messiah not only took on our form, but he became for us a God with skin on. Our God is not one who is made known to us from afar, but one who came to live with us. The Bible informs us that Jesus was very much like a running man. Bear with me here, bear with me here. I would even deign to say that Jesus is the consummate fullback. As we study the word of God, we see that Christ showed us how to live grace-filled lives. In taking away the sting of death and redeeming us from our sins, Jesus blocks that which separates us from God. When he teaches people to love with all their heart, soul, and mind the God of all creation, and to love their neighbor as they love themselves, Christ shows us how to receive instruction. In healing the sick, curing the lame, and feeding the hungry, we are being detoured from self-ambition as we are now taught how to live Christian lives in this needy and broken world. Jesus shows us how to run gracefully toward the goal line at life's end. Our aim is to make it into the end zone, or to say it another way, to make it into the eternal kingdom. 
Jesus knew firsthand what it was like to be displaced as a refugee. The reality of a refugee is often that one is running away from those who want to destroy one's life. The Messiah, through his life on earth, is showing us that we can also run toward that which gives us life. Jesus Christ opens his arms and offers us a place in the kingdom, a place in which we will find refuge. When we understand that in Jesus we are sheltered from the things that would kill our souls, we are empowered to act as disciples of Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are then able to minister to those who seek solace from trying and dangerous times. When we, the people of God, are invited to run with endurance, we can do so gracefully, trusting in the Lord. There are many ways in which we can demonstrate God's love to those who are desperate to experience the loving nature of God. This is particularly the case when we are disillusioned by life's detours. Are there any detours that you have experienced in your life? Perhaps one had plans to go to a particular university and the acceptance letter does not come back. Instead, you have to leave your first choice and go to a second choice university, which seems unfair. And yet God's providence is that even though there's this little jag in one's life's trajectory, it is at this second place of higher learning that you meet your future spouse. It might be that a particular job that you have pursued is no longer available because the company has decided to outsource that division. Ugh. Back to the drawing board. Time to rethink employment options. And yet, in this next place that you work, you will find that you utilize a lot more of the skills with which you are blessed. It might be that there's an unexpected twist in one's retirement plans, or the retirement plans of one's parents. The onset of dementia or the death of a spouse may lead one to alter their plans. <laughs> However, beloved, in all these situations that we face, any detours in our plans, we know that God is with us. The family of four that I spoke about earlier who drove into exile were soon joined by a son. This baby was the crown prince and would have been the next in line on the throne had they remained in their country of origin. Divine intervention meant that there was a detour in their lives. One, if not taken, would have led to their demise. Beloved, God is reaching out to people like you and me through dreams and wise counsel of people who share Christ's message of hope. God, who is love, invites us into full relationship. What divine detours does the Almighty have in store for this church as we move into our 150th year of ministry in Wayne? Who will God lead to join us as new church members? In how many of the adult education course offerings will you participate in 2020? It is now our time to reach out in love by taking the message of Christmas out to the neighborhoods, into this town, and indeed into the world. May God bless all the ministries in which this church is currently involved and those to which God will lead us, running faithfully toward the kingdom goal as a school for love. Amen.
Beloved, as you run out from this church, go and spread the joy of Christmas to all that you meet. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love. May it be so. Amen. Go Eagles. Amen.